That voice was a four-year-old daughter comforting her mother just moments after her mother's boyfriend, Philando Castile, was shot by a police officer near St. Paul, Minnesota, back in July. This shooting happened just one day after another black man. Alton Sterling was shot by a police officer in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The shooting provoked days of protests right across the United States and reignited the debate about race in households everywhere. Navigating those conversations with your children can be difficult, and different discussions are being had depending on the race of your household. We've assembled a panel of parents to weigh in on this topic. Joining us on your morning today are Michelle Hughes, Craig Wellington, and Gloria Roheim McRae. Thank you for being here for this important conversation. Thanks, you know, it's one of the stories that came out of those events in the summertime, and friends of mine within the black community, I discovered there are different rules for parenting, different conversations that are being had, and I, I wanna start with you, Michelle. How do you parent, and what are the kinds of conversations you have in your household? Well, with us, I have uh, three children, uh, two boys that are six and eight, and a 14-year-old daughter. And with my boys, for example, when it comes to uh, playing outside, there's children that have Nerf guns or play guns, and I'm very clear, you do not touch those guns, you do not play with those What's guns. What's the fear behind that? My fear is Tamar Rice, who was a, a black child who was playing by himself in the park that got shot with a fake gun. I don't want to, uh, even if it's a Nerf gun and it is brightly colored, I don't want anybody to mistake it for anything else. Because at the end of the day, even if everybody, the world is outraged, your child is still dead. There's still a, a son, a black son that's out there that's dead. So for me, first of all, I don't believe in the gun culture, so I don't really want them playing with guns anyways. But my fear is they're out there. And my neighbors know it. We've talked about it. And Craig, they agree with me. Do you feel, Craig, the need to raise your children differently based on race? Uh, absolutely. And it's uh, very interesting that Michelle brought up that point. Uh, right in the green room a while ago, one of your previous guests were having a conversation where they were talking about um, their child and how, you know, they're playing with guns and buying them BB guns and so on. And I sat there and it was, it's very interesting. It's not a conversation I would ever have. And it's not a conversation that any black parent I know has. And in fact, they specifically tell their kids, don't play with a gun. And it's a reality. Um, and we can pretend that we live in a world where race does not exist, but um, these are systemic things that you have to deal with. And you know that you, you are looked at differently and it's about mitigating risk. Yes. Uh, Gloria, I want to bring you in on this conversation as well. Your husband is black. You're raising a mixed race son. He's an infant at the time, but you are looking ahead to parenting. There, there he is there. Nope. <laughs> you are looking ahead to some of the issues he may be facing when he's older. And what are you learning about conversations and, and parenting differently? Yeah, I mean, there's so many considerations that when you imagine having a child as a Hungarian white woman when you're, you know, younger, that you don't consider. And conversations just, that wouldn't have been had in your household. They would not have. And then so, you know, when my son is born and my husband is of a medium complexion, I'm clearly of a paler complexion, and our son is sort of racially ambiguous at the moment. And that can change. So, you know, you'll hear things from family members, oh, I hope he keeps this complexion. Or you'll hear this in public, you know, oh, mixed race children are the most attractive children. All troubling, really subversive ways of, of really damaging one another. And these are the, the subtleties in Canadian culture that I'm picking up on. Can I, I have to be responsible. Can I bring in an example that, that was really telling for me? And that was around the issue of clothing. So, uh, you know, I go out and I purchase a, a hoodie for my son, and I would never think to have a conversation about an article of... Both of you are nodding. No. Explain to me why in a black household uh, this is an issue. Well, my sons love hoodies. Uh, when uh, Trayvon Martin, when that incident happened, I remember talking to my mom on the phone. We were dri I was driving around Bathurst and Lawrence. I'm sorry, Bathurst and Lakeshore. And I'm literally looking around. There's not, not one black person with a hoodie on. And I just thought, wow, you know, Trayvon Martin was demonized because of his hoodie. I have a picture with my sons with their hoodies, and they love them. And as they grow older, I wonder, you know, am I supposed to stop them from wearing hoodies? People feel threatened by them wearing these hoodies. And it's extremely scary to think that somebody would look at my children and assume that they're, and be threatened by them based on their clothing. And I think that, that is the, the most difficult part yes. because you, you struggle with that conversation. Mm -hmm. Do I have it? Do I tell my child don't do, yes. do something to change themselves? Mark Zuckerberg yes. wears hoodies all the time. Right. Yes. That's not a problem. But knowing that my child will be judged based on the article of clothing, a beautiful roots, uh, Canadian hoodie right. that 
potential we have to walk past. It, it becomes an, a, a dangerous article. It, it, yes. Again, Absolutely. mitigating risk. Exactly. So let's talk about those conversations yeah. then. At what age do you have them? How do you frame them? And does it change based on gender? I mean, I can yeah. say that my newborn is seven and a half months, and I guess he doesn't classify as newborn, but he is to me. And I'm, I'm thinking about things like you saw in the picture of just exposing him to seeing himself reflected, seeing di different members of his family reflected in toys, in stories, mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in the different narratives that he's seeing so that he sees a place and a belonging in those different ways. And, you know, that's a very, again, different conversation. Santa Claus is just white to white families. And that's, you know, a different conversation in our household with my Trinidadian family who intentionally has, for example, black angels on their Christmas tree. Right. These are different things that he'll see that I hope that will help give him a good sense and you know of, of where he belongs. Craig, your, your kids are a little bit older. When did you have what I learned is referred to as the talk? Um, well, the, the, the thing is it can be something organic. It doesn't have to be a talk per se, but what you have to understand is you have to prepare them so they can deal with it. But what do you say? It, it depends. Unfortunately, there are times when it, the, the talk is pushed upon you. Yes. I mean, when my child made the, makes the school basketball team, and, and, and comes home and that's a great thing. And then a week later comes home and shows a copy, a print of an email that the teacher received, the, the, the manager from another teacher saying, well, the entire team is black. By the time report cards come, you're gonna lose half your, half your team on our academic suspension. And that's a conversation that I have to deal with as a, as a, as a parent that the, the hockey team's parents didn't have to deal with. Right, hearing being being at the at a game and, and seeing my son get called the N word. That's that that's my the reality. And and for myself, with both my children, it's happened around the same time, which is around grade one and two. Again, not something I planned to have. I didn't have. I wasn't called the N word until I was in grade, until I was ten years old. Because we raise our kids to to want to accept everybody. Of so course. how do you then explain to them that there are people who will look at you differently? Well, they had it because we were on the bus in September, and some woman told my eight-year-old that he needs to get up so that she can sit down, and then told me that I needed to go back where I was to go back to where you come from. And I said Etobicoke, <laughs> and she said, No, where you were born. I said, Yes, Etobicoke. And she had this strong accent, and I said, were you born here? And she's yelling on the bus. And then two weeks ago, my kids and I are in the store, and this man's looking at my, my youngest. He's got candy, and he said, you know, what are you doing over there? And I said to him, I said, I'm standing here. I understand kids go into stores, right. and they might put things in their pocket. Not mine, but, you know, kids yeah. can. So I said to him, I'm standing here. I'm his parent. They're not going to take anything. So they're waiting. They're fussing around. He makes noise again. I said, excuse me, what is the problem? I'm right. standing right here. Well, they're taking too long. And then when I went up, I put this stuff, the kids put this stuff on the counter, and then I looked at him and I said, you know what? I am not giving you my money. And Marie, I, I think said, you will not treat my children like that. And I told the kids, I said in the car, I said, are you thieves? And they said, no. And I said, were you planning on stealing? And they said, no. And I said, you will you'd never give somebody your money who treats you like a thief. And it's, so that's now we have to have that conversation. And it's those examples of candy stores and, and clothing that you, re, that you realize kids are, having, are being treated like they're that people are afraid of them, mm -hmm. oh. but, but they know that they're not doing anything wrong. I want to, want to move on to the events that happened over the summer in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, people will say that that is a U.S. problem. We don't have it as bad here. Craig, your response to that? Um, you know, it, everything is in, is in degrees. Obviously, the U.S. is almost like the Wild West. Actually, the Wild <laughs> West had gun control, so probably not. <laughs> but but there, are, there are enough incidents that have happened here, and certainly with... Um, uh, the statistics on First Nations uh, people in, in Canada, they certainly rival, rival, rival the U.S., but there certainly have been main incidents. Even when I was, was, was younger, sitting in, in the, the, uh, the courtroom with the Lester Donaldson trial and the, uh, the Wade Lawson trial, and I was there as the, you know, the police uh, issues. But these things happen, and the, fir the first thing is what we're seeing now, what's new is the cameras. Right. And, and, and we have to be careful of not saying, okay, well, something new is happening. This is something that is systemic. It's happened for, for years. And these are things that we have to be cognizant of. And it's dangerous to pretend they don't happen here. So much longer we could spend on this conversation, but I want to wrap it up with this. And that is, what do you wish that every household, parents in every household would have around this conversation? Whether you're white, black, brown, what do you hope would come from those conversations? I think the key is, I mean, really, everybody needs to learn about everybody's culture. And if you don't do that, I mean, it's crazy that in schools we don't learn about the Aboriginal culture. My children have had the opportunities, have been at uh, the Six Nations of Grand River's ter territory. We don't know while we're, and, and with teachers as well, that starts there. 
of the teachers, we're learning, we all know Beethoven, we know, all know Tchaikovsky, we all know uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, but we don't know about William Still or Florence Price or Robert Nathaniel Dett. Bring in uh, the storytellers. We've got, uh, what about Langston Hughes mm -hmm. and James Baldwin mm -hmm. and, and, and those people. So Highlight positive aspects of the culture. Yeah, and, but everybody's culture because right. everybody has contributed to this society and to Canada and to the world and the inventions of this world. And if, if, if everybody knew everybody's value, right. then nobody would have a superiority complex and nobody would have an inferiority mm -hmm. complex. Craig and Gloria, really quickly, what do you wish that parents of other races knew? Uh, just, just have an open mind, embrace all, all cultures, and it's, an op it's always an opportunity to learn. I mean, my mom always used to say, you know, your garden is beautiful because of all the different flowers and, 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 sh and shapes, and that's, people are like that, that too. Gloria, and I would say really quickly that, you know, we challenge, we get uncomfortable with the idea of racism, but in Canada, don't look for the KKK showing up with a gun. Look for the subtle things like low expectations of children of color. Look at the low expectations of us in, um, you know, in professional settings, women, people of color, the, the, the non-white cultures, and you'll notice that's where it's embedded. And, and that's where we have to look to really address it. Because yes, we're multicultural, but we have a lot of work to do in terms of changing those expectations of one another. And so, really, really quick, if, if when your child notices a difference, right. people get very scared. Yes. You know, they say, when the child says, why is that person, why are they browner, you know, why are right. they darker than me, why are their eyes different? Don't ignore it, don't say shh. Just have, the, it. Conversation. have yeah. the conversation. We're not invisible. When people say they don't have color, they don't, they see, don't color, see color, it's color. very insulting. Yeah. Yeah. Because so there is color, there is and color. all the colors are beautiful. Exactly. All we have to wrap it yes. up, and this is a conversation I could have for the rest half hour. We'll probably have it into the commercial break. But Michelle and Craig Gloria, thank you so much for being here, thank and thank you thank for you. sharing thank your you. stories. Thank you.